Hello, and welcome. I'm Frank Lavallo, and you're listening to Novel Conversations, a program about the world's greatest stories. Each week on Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one novel, and together we summarize the story for you. We'll introduce you to the characters, tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. And at the end of the show, I talk to our researcher, Ted Schwartz, for endnotes. Ted always has something interesting to tell us about the book and the author. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Today I'm going to have a conversation about the novel, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. And I'll be joined in conversation by our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. Joan, Patrick, hello. Hello, Frank. Hi, Frank. Before we start our conversation today, let me read a brief introduction to our novel, Brave New World. Written by Aldous Huxley and published in 1932, Brave New World is a dystopian novel where two pillars of Western civilization, the family and religion, have been destroyed and replaced by a science industrial complex designed to erase the individual, promote the state, all while keeping the population happily working in a drug-induced stupor. Though written to be an example of a utopian paradise where even embryos are engineered to produce perfectly happy citizens, Huxley uses two alienated characters to expose the stultification that occurs in a society where dreams are made to be fulfilled and where one size fits all, though none too well. With that introduction, Joan, let me ask you, is this the first time you read Brave New World? Well, I didn't think so. It must have been a book I read, but then I couldn't remember reading it in high school. So, nope, this is the first time I've read this book. Well, what did you think of it on your first reading? Well, I kept going back to the copyright date. When was this published? When was this published? It's amazing. It's so prescient, and it was written 80 years ago, and it's a little scary. I think it was a lot scary, (laughs) especially for 1932. Right. Patrick, let me ask you, is this the first time you read Brave New World? Actually, yes, it was, although, like Joan, I was confident that I had read this book before as well, along with 1984 and similar dystopic novels. But as I got into it, I realized that I must not have read this book because there were too many things that struck me that I would have remembered had I read it before. Patrick, you're right. I think if you had read a book that turned Henry Ford into a god and a religion, I think you would have remembered that. That's right. I would have remembered Soma. But before we talk about Henry Ford as a religion and explain to our listeners what Soma is, let's start where our novel starts at the very, very beginning. This novel was published in 1932, but it's not set in 1932. Where and when is it set? The story is set in the distant future. Actually, it's set in the year 632 AF. After Ford, of course. Henry Ford, the car builder? (laughs) That's right. This society measures their time from the production of the first Model T. The car? Well, this was a society that worshipped technological advancement, and Ford was the inventor of mass production. And one of the chief benefits of mass production was and is uniformity. And stability. Both things which are very highly esteemed in this society. That's what they say. And maybe it explains why the novel actually begins in the Central London Hatchery and Conditioning Center. What are they hatching and what are they conditioning? Well, Frank, they're hatching human embryos and they will be conditioning them to their lot in life. This really is a factory, a mass production factory. Patrick, what did Joan mean by conditioning them for particular jobs? Well, one of the principal things this society hopes to achieve is stability. That requires that all the different people in society are good at what they do and are happy at what they do. So embryos are from the very beginning conditioned to perform certain roles in society. Some of those are menial jobs like mining, and some of those are more intellectual pursuits. That's right, Patrick. What they do in the embryonic stage is the physical conditioning, preparing these embryos to assume their physical characteristics when they're grown. Once these embryos are actually children, they begin the mental conditioning. Right. Once they're decanted and hatched, there's psychological conditioning that goes on. A large part of it is subliminal and hypnotic. They do it while the kids are sleeping at night. Right. These soft phrases will be repeated endlessly while they're sleeping at night. And as the children grow, they'll come to accept these attitudes that they hear. Right. Each one of them will hear in their sleep a phrase fit for their cast in life. I'm so glad I'm a beta. I don't want to be a delta. I don't want to play with delta children. And then, of course, the delta children will hear, I'm so glad I'm a delta. I don't want to be a beta. I don't want to play with beta children. And they literally hear this hundreds of times on a schedule every night, maybe for three weeks. Then there'll be a new message every night for three weeks. Then back to this message every night for three weeks, literally for years. Right. And then there are other methods where a group of children are introduced to flowers and picture books of animals. 
And as they see these things, and naturally as children do, they're interested in these. Excited by the colors and the pictures. Exactly. As the children approach the flowers and the animals, alarm bells go off, sirens go off. The children receive electric shocks. And the point of this is to condition this batch of children to not like flowers and nature and rural pastoral pleasures. But why would they want that? This is a group of lower caste children. Society wants to keep them happy in their urban setting, not wanting to go out into the countryside, happy with the sort of entertainments that will be provided for them in their apartments. But this society, remember, is based on Ford and the worship of his mass production skills and the consumerism that that encourages. And they want these children to hate the country but love country sports and the elaborate apparatus that the sports need. Right, so the ultimate purpose of all this conditioning is to create a stable society where people are not yearning to improve themselves. They're happy with their, as Joan said, lot in life. Well, we've mentioned that we're in the hatchery and conditioning center, but we haven't said what we're doing there and who we're with. Well, the book has opened in the hatchery because the director is giving a tour of it to some students. And he actually turns to one of the employees, a Henry Foster, and asks him to explain some of these processes to the students. That's right. And it's through Henry Foster that we're told about the process of hatching and of conditioning these embryos. And we're also given a quick description of the five casts as well. Yes. And we're getting a sense of how proud everyone is of their high-tech fertilization processes. And how they abhor the primitive way in which children used to be born. Oh, yes. How gross. That's right. At one point, the director makes an allusion to the old methods of childbirth. And for a couple of the young students, it's almost as if he was using profanity. Right. They consider even mentioning the way things used to be as obscene. That's right. None of these boys can use the word mother without considering it an obscenity and blushing. It's really strange. And at this point, our story moves to the women's changing room at the hatchery, where we're quickly introduced to Lenina Crown and her good friend, Fanny Crown, no relation. And they're talking about Lenina's scandalous behavior. That's right. Lenina has actually been dating our Henry Foster, who we just met, almost exclusively now for a couple months. All right, but wait, you said there was scandalous behavior involved. Where is that? Well, Frank, monogamy? That's horrible. (gasps) That's right, I forgot. Yeah, the whole moral code is turned on its head here in the future. Everyone believes that they are for everyone else. And the idea of an exclusive relationship with someone is seen as scandalous. Because, of course, there is no such thing as family. We all come from the hatchery. Right. There are no mothers and fathers and brothers and cousins. There are no relationships. And no need for them. Yeah, but doesn't Lenina explain to Franny that for now she's okay with just having one guy? And besides, she's actually been checking out another guy, Bernard. That's right, Bernard Marx. And this continues to shock Franny because Bernard has a bit of a reputation as a nonconformist. But isn't that mostly based on his physical appearance? Yes, even though he is categorized as a prime alpha male. Actually, alpha plus. (laughs) Right. There's something just not quite right about him. Something must have gone a little wrong in the test tube. He's not quite as tall and as solidly built as all alphas are. And he doesn't seem to care about being an alpha male. But we are constantly reassured that just because his physical appearance is not quite alpha-like, his mind is definitely alpha plus. That's right. But Patrick, she's more than just a little intrigued with Bernard. That's right. Actually, she's been weighing an invitation from Bernard to go on a weekend getaway to a reservation. Right. And we actually have a scene where she runs into him in a crowded elevator. In seeing him, she immediately begins to talk to him openly about their upcoming trip and the things they'll do together. Their upcoming trip and tryst. Right. And Bernard is horribly embarrassed. He wishes she wouldn't speak out loud about these things. But of course, to Lenina and the rest of society, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Actually, the fact that Bernard might be going away with Lenina inures to his benefit in the eyes of some of the other men. Right. And Lenina burnishes her own reputation at the end of this elevator ride, where after talking to Bernard about their upcoming trish, she tells him she has to run because she has to go out with Henry tonight. Well, it sounds to me, Patrick, like Bernard may be not quite completely conditioned. Right. I think we can detect a little human nature poking through in Bernard. Some human individuality. And I've got to tell you, in reading this part about Bernard, it makes me wonder, well, if it didn't quite take with him, maybe there are others out there in the society that aren't fully conditioned to it either. Then you must have been intrigued to meet Helmholtz Watson. Yes. Huxley writes it like this. What the two men shared was the knowledge that they were individuals. 
Right. Hem Holtz Watson is a friend of Bernard's. Actually, I guess his only friend, if he has one. And Hem Holtz is an alpha plus plus. Which is seen as a mental defect, essentially. Right. He's a little brighter than the brightest. His job happens to be to write these sort of trite phrases that are repeated for the children while they sleep. But his intellectual powers have led him to believe that there's got to be something more to this life. But neither one of them can figure out what that something more might be. And essentially in this society, it's just the thought that there maybe is something more that makes these two different and potentially a danger to their society. Right. Contentment seems to be the rule in this society. You should be happy and content in your class. Right. But Bernard does try to participate in society. And Patrick, since he didn't have a date with Lenina tonight, he ends up going to a solidarity service night. That's right. Every other Thursday is Bernard's day to go to solidarity services, which are at, of course, the Fordson Community Singery. Which is actually this society's version of church. And religion. Exactly. Again, this is sort of a continuing way in which the society sort of meets these latent human desires, I think. So they go to this service, which consists of singing a bunch of hymns, which are basically old music and old hymns with new lyrics. And then everyone eats some strawberry ice cream laced with Soma. Then they have an orgy and go home. (laughs) Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. (laughs) What is Soma? Explain that, please. Well, Soma is a drug, which is widely and freely available to all people in society. Encouraged, as a matter of fact. Exactly. It's passed out after your work shift is over every single day. Right. Again, you know, all the conditioning in that can only do so much. So you need sort of a regular maintenance to keep people happy. They're popping somas every day, every chance they can get, except for Bernard. Except for Bernard. What's Bernard doing? Well, he just thinks there's something wrong with that. So he doesn't do it. He's such an individual, that Bernard. (laughs) Yeah, silly him. Well, Joan, you and I are chuckling about Bernard being a bit of an individualist, but it's not setting well with his boss, the director of the Hatchery and Conditioning Center. Well, right. And Bernard's a little nervous about that because he has to ask the director for a permit to go to this reservation. Why would you need a permit to go to a reservation on a vacation? Well, the reservation, there are several apparently left in the world, and they are actually reservations where they have not experienced the progress of our dear Ford. Basically, they're communities... Of real humans. <laughs> yeah, of real people who live and die and are born... You mean like us? Right. Born to the M word? Yes, born to a mother. Oh. These are considered savage reservations. Right, and they're mostly located in very inhospitable places that aren't fit for either agriculture or some other useful purpose. Which explains why they have been untouched. Correct. So, Joan, does he get his permit to go to one of these reservations? Well, yes. Fortunately for Bernard, the director noticed the particular reservation that Bernard was going to. He got a little nostalgic because 20 years or so ago, he went to that reservation and he went with a girl. And then he told Bernard, but there was a horrible storm and I lost her. And as he's coming out of the story, he realizes he might have told Bernard too much about his past. And he turns on Bernard and warns him that he's heard about his nonconformist ideas overall and that he better toe the line or he could be exiled. But actually, Bernard doesn't seem to be cowered by this threat. In fact, when he leaves the room, Huxley writes, Bernard left the room with a swagger, exulting as he banged the door behind him in the thought that he stood alone and battled against the order of things, elated by the intoxicating consciousness of his individual significance and importance. He felt strong enough to meet and overcome affliction, strong enough to face even Iceland. Right, Frank, but Huxley gives us a hint that this was a somewhat false swagger because the very next sentence reads, This confidence was the greater for his not for a moment really believing that he would be called upon to face anything at all. Iceland was just a threat. So Bernard is sure proud of his latent individualism, but we're not sure he's going to be able to live up to it. Right. We don't know yet about Bernard, but we do know that he has his permit and Mm -hmm. he's about to head off to the reservation with Lenina for a vacation. And Patrick, after spending a night in Santa Fe, they go to the reservation and quickly meet the warden. Right. He quickly begins to bore them all with the details and facts and figures of acreages and all that sort of stuff. Well, not to worry. Lenina had taken a little Soma to get through it. Right. After a moment or two, she pops a Soma pill so she can sit serenely smiling at him while he reels off these facts and figures. One of which is that they're not quite sure how many savages live on the reservation. They estimate about 62,000. In fact, the warden goes on an interesting soliloquy here. He says, yeah, about 60,000 Indians and half-breeds, absolute savages. 
No communication whatever with the civilized world. Still preserve their repulsive habits. Marriage, if you know what that is, my dear young lady. Families, no conditioning. Extinct languages like Spanish. Pumas, porcupines, other ferocious animals. Infectious diseases. Priests, venomous lizards. All kinds of bad things. Right. It's hard to remember in that description that he's talking about the vestiges of the world we live in. <laughs> That's right. It'd be me, you, and Patrick behind that fence. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and finally, they get to see the savages of this reservation. And what's their reaction to that? Well, Lenina is simply repulsed. These people are old, and they look old. These people have diseases you can see. And wrinkles. Oh. And they're dirty. And some of them are fat. It's just disgusting to her. That's right. We need to remember, in Lenina and Bernard's society, men and women don't age. Not until the day they die. That's right. And then they die. <laughs> As she looks upon this filthy village that they're in, she recalls that cleanliness is next to fordliness. <laughs> <laughs> and there's none of that here. And civilization is sterilization. But none of that prepares them for their next shock. One of the young Indians comes up to them and speaks to them in perfectly good English. High English. He starts with, hello, good morrow. And then he asks, you're civilized, aren't you? You come from the other place. And of course, this shocks them because they didn't expect any of the savages to have any knowledge of outside the reservation. Who is this young Indian? He and his mother, Linda. His mother. Oh, Lenina didn't like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Again, the M word. Hmm. Right. And he tells the story about how his mother was from the other place, from mm -hmm. the civilized world, and that she was on a vacation with a man similar to Bernard and Lenina some 20 years ago when she became lost and separated. Joan, this story is beginning to sound a little familiar. Yeah, Bernard thought so, too. Yeah, his ears pricked up at this. And it turns out that this young man's mother was pregnant at the time. She ends up being taken in by the Indians, and she gives birth to this boy, and they've been living on the reservation since then. But before they can hear any more to this story, they get to meet this boy's mother, much to Lenina's horror. Why is Lenina horrified? Well, Huxley writes, Lenina noted with disgust that two of the front teeth were missing, and the colors of the ones that remained, she shuddered. And all the lines in her face, the flabbiness, the wrinkles. This was a sight Lenina couldn't believe existed. But Linda's excited. People from the other place. She rushes up and wants to kiss and hug them all. This Linda is anxious to tell her horrible, pitiful story about being stranded here on the reservation without any Soma. <laughs> and Joan, it's at this point that Bernard finally realizes just who Linda is. Right. He realizes that this woman must have been the girl that the director lost in a storm. And that would mean that this young boy is probably the director's son. And that would mean Bernard would not have to go into exile. Sort of a get-out-of-Iceland card. <laughs> That's right. Tell me a little bit about this boy, who we now know is named John. Well, John's about 20 years old, and he is sort of an outsider in his world. An individual. Right. His mother is looked down upon because of her background and her behavior while on the reservation. Because, of course, Linda, his mother, was conditioned that all the men are available to her. Everyone is for everyone. Exactly. And the women on the reservation don't take so kindly to that. They sort of have a proprietary notion of their husbands. <laughs> Imagine that. Funny. So she is abused and beaten on the reservation. Of course, John is raised by his mother with these wonderful stories of the other place of civilization. But at the same time, he's also exposed to pornographic books, namely the collected works of Shakespeare. <laughs> Shakespeare really informs his entire way of thinking. He speaks in the bard's lines. Right, he has a very Shakespearean vocabulary. His ideas of how you're supposed to live are drawn from Othello. The tragedies, the comedies. His attitudes towards women have been formed by Romeo and Juliet, for instance. Right, so with that in his mind, looking towards this other place, the civilized world, I think he imagines it to be this wonderful place with these beautiful Shakespearean qualities. In fact, it's he who gives the title to our book. He uses Shakespeare's line and calls this other place, the place that Bernard and Lenina came from, the brave new world. And Linda's dream to return to civilization are going to work perfectly for Bernard. Because, of course, Bernard has a very strong motivation to bring these two savages to the brave new world. But how does he accomplish that? Well, Bernard makes a call to the world controller. That would be Mustafa Mond. That would. 
And what do you know? Mustafa Mond agrees. And issues all the necessary orders. Everything. So before you know it, Bernard and Linda and John and Lenina are landing back in London. And less than a day later, Bernard's in front of the director again. But this time, he's got the upper hand. Well, he didn't at first. Right. While Bernard's been on vacation, the director has decided that he is going to go ahead and ship him off to Iceland, sort of make an example of him in front of all the other alphas. Which gives Bernard the perfect opening. Exactly. Just as he's being dismissed by the director and being made a fool of in front of all his colleagues, the director makes one mistake. Right. He sort of smugly looks at Bernard after reciting this irrefutable list of scandalous behavior and asks him, can you show any reason why I should not now execute the judgment passed upon you? And Bernard says, I've got two reasons. Then show it, said the director, at which point in walk, John and Linda. And at which point Linda immediately recognizes her date from 20 years ago, the director. And not only that, but she calls out to him, oh, Tomikins, Tomikins, Mm -hmm. don't you remember me? Oh, the horror. The mortification. Yes. I mean, at first, everyone's sight of Linda, as Lenina's first impression was one of horror. But then Linda utters the fatal words, you made me have a baby. There was a sudden and appalling hush. Yeah, now this isn't funny. That's quite an accusation. Now this is obscene behavior on the part of the director. And with that, John turns to the director and says, my father. And hearing a boy call their director father was just too much for the other employees. And as Huxley writes, laughter broke out, enormous, almost hysterical, peal after peal, as though it would never stop. And the director rushed from the room. Well, now, while this revelation is a disaster for the director and in fact causes him to lose his job, It's actually a great thing for Bernard, not to mention John and Linda. Tell me what happens with Bernard. Well, Bernard's a celebrity. He's sort of the ringmaster to this little circus that he's returned with. Although Linda quickly checks herself into a Soma holiday from which she'll never return. But John is sort of this civilized savage who is trotted around to cocktail parties so that people can meet him and stare at him. And of course, as his guardian or his keeper, Bernard is invited to meet the best people. And women. That's right. And also during this time, John is developing quite a crush on Lenina. An unrequited crush at this point. Well, right. Lenina is just incapable of falling in love with someone. Certainly not in a Shakespearean way. (laughs) But they do feel attraction, and she's willing to act on that attraction with him. Ready, willing, and able. But John, of course, is looking at the world through Shakespearean eyes. Romantic eyes. Real human eyes. So he's sort of repelled by her promiscuous behavior. And, of course, Lenina does not understand that. All right, well, that's what John gets himself up to, but I want to go back to the story of Linda. Patrick, you said that Linda checks herself into a Soma vacation. Right. Essentially, she's in a hospital or a nursing home taking massive doses of soma, basically in a permanent coma. You know, this is John's mother, so he's concerned about this, and he's asking the doctors, well, isn't this harmful for her? Isn't it going to kill her, shorten her life? And the doctors respond, if she's lucky. In one sense, yes, the doctor admitted, but in another, we're actually lengthening it. John stared, uncomprehending. Soma may make you lose a few years in time, the doctor went on, but think of the enormous, immeasurable durations it can give you out of time. Every Soma holiday is a bit of what our ancestors used to call eternity. And the doctor continues, of course, you can't allow people to go popping off into eternity if they've got any serious work to do. All the same, John persisted, I don't believe it's right. All right, Joan, while Linda's in her Soma-induced holiday, I understand John goes to see his first movie, except they call him Feelies? Right. He gets a date with Lenina, and they go to the Feelies. You can see the movie, you can feel the air, the wind, you can smell, feel the vibration in your chair, and the experience of being at one of these feelies is quite sensual. And very new for John. And very weird for John. And he doesn't like it. Nope. No, he says, I don't think you ought to see things like that, uh, Lenina, and she's sort of taken aback. Things like what, John? And He just knows that this is wrong, what they just watched. And again, the moral world is turned on its head. And so while John is still attracted to Lenina, he knows they still are very much of two different worlds. And Patrick, it's this experience at the Feely that really begins John's pulling away from now this society on this side of the fence. 
That's right. And he doesn't have the other place to look forward to. And essentially, this is where John decides he's not going to be their circus freak anymore. And that's bad news for Bernard because he's been sort of living off of John. Sure, he's been dining out on this. Right? Exactly. And Bernard is panic stricken. All the people turn on Bernard like that. They remember he wasn't quite a perfect alpha. They sure do. And of course, while this puts a strain on the relationship between Bernard and John, John grows closer to Bernard's friend, Helmholtz Watson. Right. Watson thinks he's found a bit of a kindred soul in John and that they both love and appreciate intellectual pursuits. Helmholtz shares his poetry with John, who says it's pretty good. But then John recites Shakespeare to Helmholtz, who is blown away by such writing. That's right. Let's be clear. Helmholtz has never heard Shakespeare. Shakespeare is banned in this society. Right. So when he hears the story of Romeo and Juliet, he simply can't understand a story about a mother and a father upset about a boy having a girl or not having her when he can't even understand the idea of a mother or a father. Right. It's sort of like writing a poem and agonizing over whether you should have orange pop or grape pop. That's right. And when John reads the scene about Tybalt lying dead but uncremated, all Helmholtz can think of, well, that's an awful waste of his phosphorus. Right. <laughs> and Joan, isn't it right about this time that Lenina makes one final effort to get John into bed? That's right. Egged on by Fanny and a hit of Soma, Lenina decides it's time to just go get her man. And she shows up at John's door. And Patrick, John wants to be gotten, but he wants to earn it. He wants to win her hand, as it were. And that's what he tries to explain to her. Right. He says he wants to be worthy of her. He said, you know, back on the reservation, you'd have to kill a lion and bring the pelt back to the woman that you loved. And Lenina is just completely baffled by this. Lenina says, there aren't any lions in England. She just doesn't get it. Right. So he says, to show how much I love you, Lenina. Ooh, now that she understands. Okay. Now she thinks they're speaking the same language. Well, now she thinks language isn't necessary anymore, <laughs> but not John. John retreats in terror. Well, John gets angry with her for this base behavior on her part. And he resorts to a little Shakespeare and calls her an impudent strumpet. <laughs> At least he didn't tell her to get herself to a nunnery. <laughs> so that night ends badly. Yes, it does. Patrick, that was a bad night for both of them, but it's going to get worse for John. He gets a call from the hospital about his mother, Linda. Right, and as he arrives there, he asks if there is any hope. And the nurse, somewhat puzzled, asks, you mean of her not dying? No, of course there isn't. This is what people come here to do. Why would you care if someone died? And he whispers to the nurse that she is my mother. <gasps> well, and that's the horrified look from the nurse. Yeah. But sure enough, Linda does die. But Joan, you didn't mention what else was going on in this room while Linda was dying. Oh, that's right. There's a class of children on a field trip to learn death conditioning. That's right. This is part of their conditioning program to learn how to be accepting in the face of death. To learn how to be blasé in the face of death. Right, and of course, John is at his mother's deathbed weeping. And it's obscene. It's thoroughly indecent. The teachers, the nurses don't know what to do. The children are scandalized. And laughing at him. Right, they're laughing at him. And of course, John becomes angry and upset at that as the kids sort of point and make fun of his mother because of her appearance. And this is all just too much for John. He basically flees the hospital. Right, and he gets as far as the lobby of the hospital when he sees people who are leaving work getting their soma, and he goes ballistic. And he cries out to the people, listen, I beg of you, lend me your ears. <laughs> and he tries to tell them not to take the Soma, not to waste their lives this way. It's poison. It's poison. Right. But of course, the people don't have any idea what he's talking about. But the world controller does, and it catches his attention. And he decides it's now time for him to meet this John. Do you enjoy science, spooky stories, and all things paranormal? We do too. While we would love for most paranormal stories to be true, we are here to tell you that they probably aren't. But that doesn't make them any less fun to speculate about. We are the Spooky Science Sisters podcast. In this podcast, we bring you bi-weekly discussions on possible scientific explanations behind the supernatural. Backed up by research articles and other credible sources, we do deep dives into things like archaeology and physics and share in-depth discussions with topic experts. Visit us at SpookySciencesisters.com to listen to a couple of skeptics debunk some of your favorite alien encounters, cryptid sightings, and ghost stories with science, sass, and a significant amount of laughter. Thank you and stay spooky.
But Patrick, he also wants to talk to Bernard and Helmholtz Watson as well. How does that go for them? Well, that depends how you look at it. They're both being exiled to islands. Bernard does not take it well and actually has to be dragged, sobbing, kicking and screaming from the room, begging to be given a second chance. He was dragged, kicking, screaming, and drugged. Right, exactly. Hemholtz, on the other hand, has taken this a little more philosophically and looks at it as an opportunity. Right, because really he's going to an island of individual misfits. Joan, that's right. In fact, Mustafa Munn tells Helmholtz Watson, you're going to be sent to a place where you'll meet the most interesting set of men and women to be found anywhere in the world. All the people who aren't satisfied with orthodoxy, who've got independent ideas of their own. Then he ends with, I almost envy you, Mr. Watson. That's right, he does say that. And once he dismisses Bernard and Helmholtz and starts his conversation with John, we come to understand just why he envies them. Right, and John has picked up on this and says to him when they're alone, Art, science, you seem to have paid a fairly high price for your happiness. Anything else? Well, yes, the controller replies, we've had to give up religion as well. There used to be something called God before the Nine Years' War. Right, and at this, the controller opens a safe behind his desk and brings out his stash of pornographic books. (laughs) Pornographic books like The Holy Bible, The Imitation of Christ, The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. What's the world controller of this society doing with books like this? Well, he's got to safeguard them, of course, from the people. Because he recognizes the insights that these books hold and that they're dangerous for this kind of civilization. I think the fact that he has these books explains why he's envious of Helmholtz and Bernard. He is also an individual. He knows about the old thinking. He knows about the old religions. And he actually takes some comfort from them. But he can't let the people have it. No, he's made his choice. He says, God is incompatible with machinery and scientific medicine and universal happiness. Our civilization has chosen machinery and medicine and happiness, and that's why I have to keep these books locked up in a safe. They're smut. He really is a hypocrite, isn't he? But he has sacrificed his own individuality. Sadly, he thinks he's martyred himself for the choice of civilization. Unfortunately, though, he's forced everyone else to make that same choice. Right. But Patrick Joan, John the Savage is not convinced. He says to Mund, I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. In fact, I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. And Mund responds, well, that's the right then also to grow old and ugly, impotent, to have syphilis and cancer, to have too little to eat, the right to be lousy. And the savage John says, I claim them all. And Mustafa Mund basically says, you're welcome to them. And that's why John asked to be sent into exile with Bernard and Helmholtz. But Patrick, Mustafa Mund is not going to let John the Savage go to an island. No, that's right. He says he wants to continue this experiment. But I think also it would just be too dangerous to have someone as uncivilized. As competent as John loose in the world. So they're going to keep him where they can watch him. He's too much of an individual even for an island of individuals. Right. But he does exile himself to an old White House in the country. And he comes to a really sad end. Well, Joan, at first this exile works for John the Savage. He's by himself. He's raising his own food. He's suffering Mm -hmm. cold and heat and rain. But he does get discovered, and that ruins everything. Sure does. Right, he's sort of rediscovered by the media, and now here's the savage in the wild. Media frenzy, media frenzy. There are helicopters circling his home and people dropping down to observe him in his habitat. He actually gets caught on film whipping himself during one of his religious ecstasies. Because he wants to keep reminding himself what real pain is, because he knows that this civilization doesn't. And really, when Lenina shows up during this crazy spectacle, John is driven to the end. Well, because the whole crowd was whipped up into one of their orgy frenzies. Helped along by Soma, of course. Of course. And John wakes up the next morning and remembers all that had gone on the night before. Everything. And I think he knows that that's what life in this civilization would be forever. And it's at this point where he exiles himself one more time from this community. The helicopters, of course, return the next night to repeat this episode. They arrive to find the door to the White House ajar. They pushed it open and walked into the shuttered twilight. Through an archway on the further side of the room, they could see the bottom of the staircase. Just under the crown of the arch dangled a pair of feet. That's right, Patrick. John the Savage is no more. And that's how our novel, Brave New World, ends. Right. All right, Patrick, Joan, of course we haven't had a chance to get to every moment or character in this novel. So if you have a character you want to introduce us to or a moment you want to give us, now's your opportunity. Joan, you have something? Yes, I have a quote from John towards the end of the book when he was living that idyllic life out on the lighthouse for a little while. And as you said, he was living off the land and he said, the work gave him an intense pleasure. After those weeks of idleness in London with nothing to do, 
It was pure delight to do something that demanded skill and patience. And, you know, it's something to still remember today that we get caught up in all these neat advances we have, but sometimes it feels good to get your hands dirty. That's right. And single task sometimes. Right. Patrick, do you have a moment or a character? In John's discussion with Mond about the need or desire for God and civilization, he's trying to think of the opportunities that a belief in God provides for you. He mentions things like chastity, passion, nobility, heroism, and Mond responds, My dear young friend, Civilization has absolutely no need of nobility or heroism. These things are symptoms of political inefficiency. In a properly organized society like ours, nobody has any opportunities for being noble or heroic. Conditions have got to be thoroughly unstable before the occasion can arise. Where there are temptations to be resisted, objects of love to be fought for or defended, there, obviously, nobility and heroism have some sense. But there aren't any wars nowadays. And he goes on to point out that all impulses are given free reign in this society. So there is no such thing as self-denial. There is no such thing as temptation because you're allowed to do everything and everything is so pleasant. It sounds good, but it sure doesn't look good. Actually, Patrick, one of my favorite quotes comes from that same conversation that John the Savage is having with Mustafa Mund about the need for God or the need not to have a God. John brings up self-denial and says, with a God at least, you'd have self-denial. And Mustafa Mund says, not only do we not want self-denial, self-denial is antithesis to our community. Industrial civilization is only possible when there's no self-denial. We need self-indulgence up to the very limits imposed by hygiene and economics. Otherwise, the wheels stop turning. Right. When you want people buying things, you don't want them putting off purchasing something. Right. We don't want you to deny yourself that new sweater. We want you to buy that new sweater. It's so funny. It sounds like it'd be so great and it's so awful. Well, awful perhaps only when taken to this extreme. But that's the extreme you have to take it to if you believe in it. That is true. And I just have one more quote that came early on in the book that I thought seemed to sum up a lot and I think still has some relevance. Well, if you're going to sum up the entire novel in one sentence, please do that. (laughs) It's when Bernard and Lenina had just met John on the reservation and they realized how different these people were. And certainly John was. And John said to them, if one's different, One's bound to be lonely. Joan, I think you got it. Everyone in this novel, in the midst of this one community, are all lonely people. Although most of them don't know it. And that's where we're going to end today's conversation about the novel Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Joan, Patrick, I want to thank you both for coming in and having this conversation with me today. Happy to do it, Frank. You're welcome. Thank you again. Joining me now for endnotes on today's conversation is our researcher, Ted Schwartz. Hi, Ted. Hi, Frank. Ted, first question. Was Huxley writing about a utopia gone bad? Or was he writing about a dystopia to warn us? Neither. Oh. He was a writer. His work ranged from his first book, which was all poetry, to being a Hollywood writer, even doing the adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. So he was just looking for a good story. Then what did he know or what was he reading that made him want to write this novel? Among the things that may have influenced him, we know he was interested in Dr. Irvine Page, who was at that time finishing up three years of study on brain chemistry, first person known to have done that. He was also aware of things like the early experiments with hypnosis. How did those little tidbits of information become Brave New World? Well, that's really the writer in him. He created a story that involved the attempt of a government of a society to have social perfection, social happiness. Well, then, Ted, would you agree with me that what Huxley was writing was science fiction? It's when we read it today, we tend to focus more on the science than the fiction. Would he have approved of the way we're reading his work today? I don't think he would have thought that way. He discovered after World War II and the horrors of the deaths that social sanity might not be as bad an idea as he thought. But certainly not social sanity engineered by a totalitarian government. Certainly not. But he had not expected the world to go mad in 1931 when he wrote this. As we have discovered looking at history, war speeds scientific advances, sometimes for good and sometimes for evil. And that seems to have been the case for Huxley. You're right. I can't imagine how an author would feel to see his science fiction become real science. That was something he never anticipated, and I think the only reason he wrote about it later was because it became such a popular subject among his readers. As it remains today. Yes. Ted, thanks for bringing in your interesting endnotes about Aldous Huxley and his work, Brave New World. Always a pleasure, Frank. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Today I had a conversation about the novel A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. I also want to thank our Novel Conversations readers, Joan and Patrick Andrews. I'm Frank Lavallo, and until next week, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. Do you enjoy science, spooky stories, and all things paranormal? We do, too. While we would love for most paranormal stories to be true, we are here to tell you that they probably aren't. 
but that doesn't make them any less fun to speculate about. We are the Spooky Science Sisters podcast. In this podcast, we bring you bi-weekly discussions on possible scientific explanations behind the supernatural. Backed up by research articles and other credible sources, we do deep dives into things like archaeology and physics and share in-depth discussions with topic experts. Visit us at SpookyScienceSisters.com to listen to a couple of skeptics debunk some of your favorite alien encounters, cryptid sightings, and ghost stories with science, sass, and a significant amount of laughter. Thank you and stay spooky. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.